welcome back. Um, we have uh, another episode of Will I Ever Be Good Enough going over the book uh, written by Carol McBride. And with me is Snarky. Do you want to tell people about your channel? Hi, I'm Snarky and I don't think I'm good enough. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm a work in progress. Uh, my channel is about politics, philosophy, snark, you know, psychological stuff, sociological stuff, just whatever I feel like at the time, really. If you're into that stuff, subscribe. Yay! Yay! I'm, I'm kind of silly. Just <laughs> You've been warned. But it's okay? a good silly, so. <laughs> Yay! But yeah, we actually have video this time. Um, things are actually working, which they haven't been, so. <laughs> yeah. This should go a lot better. The tech has not been good enough. No, the tech has <laughs> definitely not been good enough. But was fixed by Greg, so. <laughs> Greg the wizard. Thank you, Greg. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are into part one um, of the book, which is recognizing the problem. And we're at chapter one, The Emotional Burden You Carry. Uh, there was a little girl who had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead. And when she was good, she was criticized anyway. Yep. <laughs> and the first little bit here. For many years, wherever I went, I was accompanied by a gang of harsh critics who made my life almost unbearable. No matter what I tried to accomplish, they were always there reminding me that I wasn't up to the task and could never do a good enough job. If I was in the midst of a spring cleaning or working hard on a home improvement project, they screamed at me, this house will never be what you want it to be. While I was exercising, they would nag at me, it doesn't matter how hard you try, your body is falling apart and you're a wimp, can't you lift more weights than that? I'd make financial decisions and they would bark at me. You're always a moron at math. And now you're a mess at finances. So freaking like story of my life. Everything I try to do is just this inner critic, right? That mm -hmm. was placed there by our moms. Um, yeah. yeah. Thanks, because mom. Yeah, thanks, Mom. Being overcritical of every little thing I ever did. Do you like go over conversations too? Like, if you talked with somebody that day, do you just like overanalyze it and be like, "Did I say anything wrong? What if I did something wrong?" Yeah, a lot of times, like I'll perceive everything I do is wrong, right? So if I have an interaction, even if it was a pleasant one, I will critique it to down to the bone, mm -hmm. like. Oh, I should have said this, and I hope I didn't offend them. And a lot of times I'll come to them and say, hey, I said this, and I didn't mean to offend you. And they're like, what? That didn't right. offend me? What are you talking about? <laughs> Nine times out of ten, that's the reaction. It's like, no, I'm yeah. fine. Like, what? There's nothing to worry about. Yeah. But I, I, said, I say I'm sorry, like, way too much. Mm -hmm. It's probably annoying to other people. <laughs> Um, I know it is to Greg. <laughs> I'm sorry, other people, for saying yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> but yeah, it's, a, you know, the, whenever you're raised in an environment where someone is overly critical, that becomes what you hear in your inner dialogue. As you grow up, it becomes a pattern of the way you think. Because when you're a child, you, you tend to mimic or mirror uh, the behaviors and things that are said by your parents. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that becomes the normal for yeah. us. Yep, it does, and we have to find a new normal. And it's really a struggle when you, you know, your inner dialogue is embedded so deeply mm -hmm. into this negative critique. So, it's totally not healthy. These incessantly disapproving voices never gave me a moment's peace. They harangued, nagged, and demeaned me with the overall message that no matter how hard I tried, I could never succeed, could never be good enough. They created such an extreme sensitivity in me that I constantly assumed others were judging me as critically as I was judging myself. Oh, yeah. And that goes back to what we were talking about. <laughs> yeah, it does. And... I brought this up in therapy and in, in cognitive behavioral therapy when I was going through it for my PTSD and 
one of the major issues is whenever I go out anywhere, mainly Walmart, because Walmart is the bane of my freaking existence, I feel like people are looking at me and judging me as harshly as I judge myself, mm -hmm. which is pretty damn harsh. Mm -hmm. uh, and that causes me a lot of anxiety. It's a major problem. It really is. And you spend effort thinking about that and you have the stress with thinking about it. So all these things are going on when they're not. Like people are more worried about what like what's going on in their little world than they are about us, but we just think that everybody is worried about us. <laughs> yeah. It, mainly people are so self absorbed. I mean granted there is like this paradigm of compare and contrast kind of things going on between human beings but I don't think I think mainly we um, blow it out of proportion mm -hmm. when we have this when we've been raised by narcissists who just critique and critique and critique mm -hmm. to the point to where you're basically nothing but a shell and even the shell isn't polished enough right and that's what I'm trying to work on now is appreciating what I can do because I mean there's a lot I can't being disabled um, I don't feel like I'm a contributing member of society but like working on what I can do in this position you know I can do videos like this I can do the shows that we do on Maddie's channel and on your channel mm -hmm. um, most of the time so like seeing value in that for once instead of just seeing what I can't do. Yeah, because those things are out of your control. Your body and the way that it functions or doesn't, mm -hmm. that's out of your control. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's it's one of those things that it's, it's healthy to let go of that feeling of inadequacy due to things you can't control mm -hmm. and focus on the things that you can. And I, I think that's a good path. That's Socratic? That is actually stoic, <laughs> stoic, stoic, stoic okay. dichotomy of control. <laughs> yes, I was like, I knew it was it was a philosophical thing um, from listening to uh, your shows on your channel. Yes. So, and I remember that hitting home, like, don't worry about the stuff that you can't control, because what you're not going to be able to do anything. Yeah, exactly. You might as well just set it down, and it it's easier said than done. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. With with practice and being mindful of it, you can, mm -hmm. you can't, your, your brain is very, there's a thing called neuroplasticity. So you can change that, the negative habits that uh, are pulling you down, like mm -hmm. clinging to things you can't control. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Very Yay. interesting. <laughs> my, cha my channel and my work is worthwhile. Oh Ooh. yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Thank you. thank you for that. Oh no, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Do you want me to read it? Because I can read it. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. I, I think I can read. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All right. So here's uh, one example of haunted adult lives that never felt that they were good enough. The first one, I'm always second guessing myself. I replay a conversation repeatedly, wondering how I could have handled it differently or to bask in my shame. Most of the time I realize there's no logical reason for me to feel embarrassed but I still feel that way. I'm really anxious about what other pe people think of me. And that's kind of like what we were talking about mm -hmm. before. Yeah. Just right into it. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one, people often compliment me on my accomplishments, my master's degree in communications, my successful public relations career, the children's book I wrote, but I can't seem to allow myself the credit I probably deserve. Probably deserve. Yeah. No, you do. Even in here. <laughs> yes, you deserve it, girl. Mm -hmm. You deserve it, Evelyn. Uh, that's who this is from. Uh, instead, I beat myself up for what I think I've done poorly or should have done better. I'm such a cheerleader for my friends. Why can't I be that way for myself? Oh. I've had so many friends say that. Like, you wouldn't say this to me. And I'm like, no, no, I totally wouldn't. They're like, so why are you doing it to yourself? <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's, that one really hits home when you realize that you're, you know, wonderful to su a support for other people, people you care about. 
and it just kind of highlights that that feeling of self-loathing that was planted there mm. by mom mm-hmm. like you know we got this feeling or I did at least that my mom just absolutely loathed me mm-hmm. and uh, as a child who didn't just being a child as a child does mirroring behaviors that's what I thought of myself that I could never achieve this or that because mm-hmm. I'm I'm X Y and Z it's just not helpful no, so the next it's not. the next one is from Susan and uh, by the way Evelyn was 35 which is around my age yeah same next, the next one is Susan 62 years old when I die, I told my husband he can carve my tombstone with she tried, she tried, she tried, she tried, and then she died. Mm-hmm. God, that really... It puts it in perspective. Yeah, it really does. And that... Coming to terms with think like, realizing that I think that way, for one, because, yes, I thought that way, but it wasn't really spelled out, um, but the book helping me realize that and go, okay, this is, that's not healthy. Like, we need to find something better to focus on and we need to work through this and we need to process it. And that's why I'm such an advocate of um, cognitive behavioral therapy because it, it helps you kind of analyze these thoughts and how they connect to the core beliefs that you have of yourself mm. that are lies. You are good enough. Mm-hmm. You are. You're good enough. You're smart enough. And God damn it, people like you. <laughs> yeah. God damn it. <laughs> I had a, a high school teacher actually um, it kind of helped me with things because I was in FFA and that was our um, advisor. And he knew what was going on at home. And of course, in a teacher's position, you can't do much, especially if it's not like overt physical abuse. Right. Um, and so he would like give me rides to FFA functions so I could go. And it was one particular bad day and I was just crying after school and I was supposed to rehearse. Um, I did public speaking competitions through FFA Ooh. and I couldn't like, I just couldn't get it together and he's like I want you to look in the mirror and I want you to say you're good enough you're smart enough and gosh darn it people like you yep. and do it over and over again until you believe it <laughs> yeah positive I still, affirmation yeah. I still kind of don't but I'm better I'm in a better place than where I was <laughs> yeah yeah it, it takes a lot of time to grow mm-hmm. out of this stuff and it, it doesn't, it's not even, growing isn't even the right word for it. Working to get out of this stuff. Because it's a lot of work. Mm-hmm. A lot of work. Uh, I also highlighted here, uh, after years of study and clinical work, I began to see the debilitating symptoms I shared with so many of my female clients had their origin in a psychological problem, in a psychological problem called narcissism. Specifically, our mother's narcissism. I realized that there are mothers who are so emotionally needy and self-absorbed that they are unable to give unconditional love and emotional support to their daughters. Mm -hmm. It's real, Mm y'all. This whole you need to respect your mama thing. It's not a given. Yeah, it's not a given. There are toxic mothers out there. There mm-hmm. are mothers out there that have no business being mothers. They just don't have it. They don't have the empathy. They're self-absorbed. Mm-hmm. It's all about them. And that is not... <laughs> that's not a healthy environment for a child to be raised in. No. I think the dynamic between daughters and mothers is really a unique one. Because, yes. you know, the the mother tends to see their daughter as them. An extension. Yeah, Yeah. an extension of them. And that is not healthy. No. No, it's not. It's separate people and separate goals and separate talents and separate feelings. and. (laughs) Yeah. And and I'm 
of the uh, belief that a parent's job is to nurture the individual that is growing up to be an adult. And they need to learn autonomy mm -hmm. and independence. Because how are they going to function in the world in a, in a healthy way if we raise them just as, you know, proto-mother, proto-us, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know? They're not like, you, mama. They're their I, own person. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, I have a really hard time making big decisions. And that's because I always ran it by mom. Like, oh, I'm thinking of doing this. What do you think of that? And she had a very heavy influence on what I would go with. And Same. like, I was at, um, when I first graduated high school, I went to the college, my first choice college, which was uh, University of Wisconsin River Falls. They have the best pre-vet program in the state. So, um, and I was go planning on going to veterinary um, medicine career route. And I ended up getting a collapsed lung while I was out there for my first semester. And my mom's like, well, why don't you come back and, and go to UWGB so you're in town and you can live with me? Oh. And I did. I dropped um, my everything there and went back and went to GB. I eventually couldn't continue with college because of the medical issues, but one of my sisters said that was, she said my heart broke that you left your choice college for her. My mom did the same thing. <clears throat> of course, when I was a teenager, I was dating this guy really, really like head over heels. <laughs> and I was supposed to get a ride somewhere and he didn't give me a ride there for some reason i think it was scheduling or whatever and she said you need to break up with him <sighs> and she was really irate about this it, it wasn't even a big deal it was just inconvenient for her right and so i did i oh. broke it off with him and that did not end well mm -mm. and late and later on like we were still friends he came to my birthday party and uh, she got him drunk, and they totally ignored me on my birthday. What the fuck? And then, like, at midnight, she took him home. I stayed home. Uh -oh. She didn't get back till 3.30 or so. You've got to be kidding. <sighs> nope. Oh, my God. Yep. <sighs> Flirting with him all night. Took him home and come back for three and a half hours later. Shit. Right? I oh had some God. I had some suspicions. Right. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, <laughs> I think they're very warranted suspicions too. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, that was always a thing, um, uh, was picking out um who to date. And if mom didn't like them, it was doomed from the start. It didn't matter. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. She's that way with Maddie. She did everything she could to break us up. And, I mean, kind of in the end, she succeeded because she was in Texas. She was sick and everything, and she guilted me into coming down there. Yeah. And just any time... Like, I didn't talk to her for a year because mm -hmm. of some other crap she did, but <laughs> when I did finally start talking to her, she was just buzzing in my ear about how awful Maddie was and, you know, how... She's there alone and has to mow by herself. And the lawnmower, the riding lawnmower, fell on her. Mm. And she was out there screaming for an hour before the neighbor heard her. Oh, crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no other word for it, really. No, there isn't. <laughs> so, healing comes from understanding and love, not blame. When we can understand the barriers to love that our mothers face which resulted in their inability to give us love, we can begin to take steps to ensure our own well-being. Your goal is to understand and take responsibility for yourself and to heal. Mm -hmm. Which is really tough. It's so easy to go, oh, it's mama's fault. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Which, you know, she's responsible for what she did, yes. Yep. But I'm responsible 
for going through the healing process and dealing with my issues. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing that, you know, I'll say at any point is that your psychological health, just like your physical health, needs to be managed by you. It's your responsibility. It's not others. And yeah, our mothers got us here, but it's our work that will take us forward from this day. Yes. And oddly enough, like, there were issues with my father too, which I'm not going to go into all that so much, but my mom would tell me, you know, he loved you as much as he was capable. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe underneath it all, she knew that she was talking about herself too. Oh, yeah. That's a definite possibility. Yeah. Ooh, that was a heavy moment. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, next section. Uh, why focus on mothers and daughters? Both boys and girls suffer emotional disruptions when a narcissistic father or mother raises them. A mother, however, is her daughter's primary role model for developing as an individual, lover, wife, mother, and friend. And aspects of maternal narcissism tend to damage daughters in particularly insidious ways. Because the mother-daughter dynamic is distinctive, the daughter of a narcissistic, narcissistic mother faces unique struggles that her brothers don't share. A narcissistic mother sees her daughter, more than her son, as a reflection and extension of herself, rather than as a separate person with her own identity. She puts pressure on her daughter to act and react to the world and her surroundings in the exact manner that mom would rather than in a way that feels right for the daughter. Thus, the daughter is always scrambling to find the right way to respond to her mother in order to win her love and approval. The daughter doesn't realize that the behaviors that will please her mother are entirely arbitrary, determined only by her mother's self-seeking concern. Most damaging is that a narcissistic mother never approves of her daughter simply for being herself which the daughter desperately needs in order to grow into a confident woman. Yeah, I still struggle with this. Mm -hmm. And even my mom died in 2008. And I still hear her voice criticizing me. Mm -hmm. Like, it just nags at me. Like, for a while, I have an urn with her ashes in it. For a while, it was just like... Anytime I would be in a room with her urn, I would mm -hmm. just get this nagging, just awful negative feeling. And a lot of that I've worked past. Now I can have it in the living room or whatever. And I'm just kind of like, you know what? If she doesn't approve, she doesn't approve. That's her right. problem. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Um, going through, my mom also passed away. And that whole experience of me especially not talking to her not taking care of her um for the last few years was really tough to go through and yeah i had the same thing when i would notice um in our old place we had the urn on the fireplace and it was a lot more like in the center of the room as opposed to right now it's in the kitchen on a on a shelf yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um yeah it's you just you associate that with her. I mean, technically it is what she used to be. Um, but yeah, it's really hard to stop that voice. <laughs> it is. You gotta fight. It's a constant fight right. with mama. <laughs> to be yourself. Right? A daughter who doesn't receive validation yeah. from her earliest relationship with her mother learns that she has no significance in the world and her efforts have no effect. She tried, she tried, and then she died. Mm -hmm. And this teaches the daughter that she is unworthy of love. And that, see, like, being raised by a narcissist is an empty feeling. Like, you feel, you have this void mm -hmm. that needs to be filled. And you try and try and try and try, and it never, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger of a void. And until you're able to fill it with things that actually fulfill you, right? it's still going to expand. And to be honest, I every once in a while, I still feel that, that void. Mm -hmm. that 
I've been abandoned, I'm unloved, I'm, you know. And all of those things are lies. They're, <clears throat> they're feelings that reflect how I was raised. Mm -hmm. And the actual abandonment and the actual feelings of being unloved that I experienced as a child. And while it's growing smaller, that void, it's still there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Narcissistic mom or dad or just, you know, abuse. Yeah. Like this, it takes a lifetime. And some people, most people, never get over it. Yeah. Yeah, I think there will always be aspects of, of the way my, you know, psyche is arranged and the way I react to things that will forever be changed. Yeah, and this all comes from the next portion I highlighted. Mm -hmm. The daughter's notion of mother-daughter love is warped. She feels she must earn a close connection to seeing to mom's needs and constantly doing what it takes to please her. And this kind of dynamic also goes into other relationships, whether mm -hmm. they're, they're your friends or your lovers or anything. You just feel like, you know, your needs don't matter but theirs do. Mm -hmm. And that is very unhealthy. Oh, yeah. Like, for me, it was like a hierarchy. Like, is everyone around me happy? And if that answer was no, it was, well, let's work on what we can do to get everybody happy. And then at the end of the day, you're like, well, I need to do a couple things. You're like, nope, I, that's yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, self-care goes out the window. And I'll tell you something. Honey, you can't please everyone. No. You're never going to be able to keep everyone happy. So you might as well take some time out for yourself mm -hmm. and care for you. Because if you don't care for you, you can't be there for anyone else. Yep. Yeah. So Quite it true. really warps the priorities. Yeah, it does. When you're raised this way. Clearly, this isn't the same as feeling loved. Daughters of narcissistic mothers sense that their picture of love is distorted, but they don't know what the real picture would look like. This early learned equation of love, pleasing another with no return for herself, has far-reaching negative effects on a daughter's future romantic relationships, which we'll see in the later chapter. Which is basically, like, you had already said that, so... Oh, uh, you know what this portion reminds me of? My mommy used to say, you know... You can love a rich man just as easy as you can a poor one. Oh. And I'm, I was like, Mom, that's not how love works. No. <laughs> you have no concept of what love is, do you? <laughs> and we would get in arguments about it. Um, and then, you know, she would be like, oh, I love you. You know I love you. I'm like, um, listen to me telling you, saying, I don't feel you love me. Yeah. Ow. Is there a roof over your head and food on the table and clothes on your back? Yeah, pretty much. That, that's not all that constitutes love. Um, there's also emotional and psychological support. Um, yeah. Yeah. Newsflash. Hello. <laughs> so the term narcissism comes from the Greek mythology and the story of Narcissus. Nar Narcissus was a handsome, arrogant, and self-involved and in love with his own image. He couldn't tear himself away from his reflection in a pool of water to become involved with anyone else, and ultimately his self-love consumed him. He died gazing at himself in the water. In everyday usage, a narcissist is someone who is arrogantly self-absorbed. Self-love or self-esteem, on the other hand, has come to mean a healthy appreciation and regard for oneself that does not preclude the ability to love others. Um... The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or the DSM, describes narcissism as a personality disorder classified by the nine traits, and we'll go over them. Uh, narcissism is a spectrum disorder, which means it exists on a continuum, ranging from few narcissistic traits to the full-blown narcissistic personality disorder. The American Psychiatric Association estimates that there are approximately 1.5 million American women with narcissistic personality disorder. Even so, non-clinical narcissism is a more pervasive problem. In truth, we all have some of these traits, and those at the low end of the spectrum are perfectly normal. 
However, as you go farther along the spectrum of narcissism, you encounter more problems. There are nine traits of narcissism, including examples of how they present themselves in mother-daughter dynamic. The narcissistic personality. So number one, has a grandiose sense of self-importance. Uh, in other words, exaggerates achievements and talents, expects to be recognized as superior without consumer achievements. Number two, is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. Not real love, ideal. Ideal, yeah. Three, believes that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood by or should associate with other special or high status people or institutions. Four, requires excessive admiration. Oh my <laughs> god. All the time. All the freaking time. Oh, the line here too is perfect. She is forever bringing up all that I do for you kids. Yep. 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 After everything I've done. Yep. Oh, God. <laughs> so many memories of that stuff. <laughs> All right. Number five. Has a sense of entitlement and unreasonable expectations of especially favorable treatment or automatic compliments. Compliance, rather, with his or her expectations. So it's got to be done my way. Yep. If it's not done my way, it's not right. Mm-hmm. Memories with that, too. <sighs> Number six is interpersonally exploitative, takes advantage of others to achieve his or her own needs. Oh my God. She would tell me, you need to date somebody that can fix my dryer. Yeah, right. Uh, oh, Lord have mercy. Oh, uh, mom would all the time try and get Greg to do like handyman stuff. And mm -hmm. Greg's not, Greg's a tech person. Um, and there was one time it was a snow and ice storm. And what happened is her basement flooded. But years ago, she was the one that decided to take the sump pump out. And so she called us and basically guilted us into going over there in the storm. Ugh. And then Greg spent hours overnight taking a sledgehammer to the basement floor, to the concrete, to break open a large enough hole so we could put a new pump in there. Gosh. And that was just one of the worst things. And like, I vowed after that, that if she asks us to do anything, I'm saying no. Uh, that's one of the reasons she didn't like Maddie. Was, yeah. You know, I've, I'm the handyman, okay? That's, that's me. Mm -hmm. Maddie is not into that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, who cares? Right? And, <laughs> but m mom did something just uh we had planned our wedding down there our first wedding um at a certain time we'd had it planned for at least six months and she was getting a surgery and this was like a month before we were supposed to get married and she decided to have her surgery right before the wedding oh for fuck's so sake i so she could <sighs> guilt me out of going on a honeymoon and spending time with my new husband. Jesus. Yeah. You know, well, why you to, I need you to take care of me. Well, then you shouldn't have fucking scheduled it there. I know. That's what I told her. She, to the whole wedding, she was all, ooh, ooh. Uh, it, oh, it was a disaster. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, speaking of that, lacks empathy, number seven. Lacks empathy, is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of others. <laughs> is often, number eight, is often envious of others or believes that others are envious of her. <laughs> yes. I can't tell you how many times I heard, oh, well, they're just jealous of me. Or, like, she had a her quote-unquote best friend. And her and her husband had met in high school. And mom would always say how Bob, the husband, was always just so much into her before he was into Judy. And how, like, oh, she's responsible for their relationship. And then, you know, just, like, hinting at these things about, like, Bob liking her. And I'm like, why are you talking about this? Like, they're oh. married. You should, like forget about that. <laughs> like, yeah, like, move on with your life. Right. 
my mom would use me in this scenario usually mm. and with her best friend who also had a daughter that was a couple years younger than me and they would i'd hear them talking on the phone oh jennifer is doing this and that and blah, 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 blah. i'm oh. like are you seriously using my life to one up your friend mm -hmm. jeez and then she would tell me, you need to do really good and blah, 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 so I can brag about it. And I'm like, oh. <sighs> Number nine, shows arrogance, haughty behaviors, or attitudes. Each of these nine traits is exhibited through behaviors that say, it's all about me and you're not good enough. Narcissists lack empathy and are unable to show love. They appear to have a superficial emotional life and their world is image oriented, concerned with how things look to others. If your mother exhibits many of the abusive narcissistic traits, you may usually feel that she doesn't really know you because she never takes the time to focus on who you really are. We daughters of narcissistic mothers believe we have to be there for them and that it is our role to attend to their needs, feelings, and desires even as young girls. We don't feel that we matter to our mothers otherwise. Very true. Yeah. Yeah, I remember my mom buying me. I hated pink. Hated oh, it. Same. She would buy me pink, 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 pink. And she would tell me, oh, you don't need to wear the clothes that I actually liked. Mm -hmm. You don't need to wear that. It reflects poorly on me. <laughs> what? Like, I'm 17 <laughs> years old. Oh, my know? Lord. How? And it was it wasn't provocative or anything. It was just different. It wasn't what she wanted. Anyway. Oh my god. And it says here, without empathy and love from her mother, a daughter lacks a true emotional connection and therefore feels that something is missing. And it, and it carries. It carries the whole life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <sighs> her essential emotional needs are unmet. In severe cases of maternal narcissism, where neglect or abuse is involved, the most basic level of parental care is missing. In more subtle cases, daughters grow up feeling empty and bereft and don't understand why. My goal is to help you understand why you feel as you do and for you to feel better. And notice that she said better and not cure. Yeah. Cured. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's a thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it is either. It's, it's, it's a lifetime struggle. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when a daughter does not receive this nurturing, she grows up lacking emotional confidence and security and must figure out a way to gain these by herself. Not an easy task when she doesn't know why she feels empty to begin with. Yes. I have the next paragraph highlighted. Uh, normally, a mother interacts with her baby and responds to her every movement, utterance, and need. She thus fosters a solid bond of trust and love. The child learns to trust her mother to provide her with physical necessities, emotional warmth, compassion, and approval, which allows her to develop self-reliance. But a mother without compassion, who fails to forge a bond with her daughter, provides for that daughter only when it is in the mother's best interest. Her mm -hmm. daughter thus learns that she can't depend on her mother. She grows up apprehensive, worried about abandonment, and expecting deceit at every turn. Yep. And I can't remember what we were talking about, but um, it was about parenting and how my mother would be like, oh, you just let the baby cry. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and that's what she did with me. That, that whole behaviorism thing. Oh, well, I'll just train my baby. Yeah. To do as I want them to mm -hmm. and cry when I want them to and meet their needs when it's convenient for me. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> And I wrote here, if there's no trust, there's no good relationship. No. And, you know, when you feel, when you have abandonment issues, you feel like you cannot trust anyone. Mm -hmm. And what does that do to any and all future relationships? Right. Just constantly but, feeling like the rug's going to be pulled out from under you. Um, people pick up on that. And yes. they're like, I don't want to deal with this. <laughs> yeah. And it's really sad. It's tragic. Mm -hmm. I do have one portion highlighted from Gail. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. That's, uh, she says, if my own mother can't love me, who can? Mm -hmm. And I so know that feeling. Mm -hmm. 
that kind of goes back to the whole abandonment issue thing. But, it really uh, does, because we were emotionally abandoned. Yes. You know, we weren't left on a doorstep, but we, we didn't have much more emotional support than if we had. Yeah, and in my mom's in my mom's case, she actually abandoned me a few times because her needs to be out with guys was more important than oh jeez meeting meeting my needs as a fourteen year old girl who was there with barely any food for a month. Oh Jesus! Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry you went through that. It it was a thing. I I don't. It's not your fault. No. It really isn't. It, it's it's her fault. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that was her fault. 100%. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the next portion I have, um, it's a natural human feeling to long for a mother who loves everything about you absolutely and completely. It's normal to want to lay your head on your mom's breast and feel the security and warmth and, of her love and compassion. To imagine her saying, I'm here for you, baby, when you reach out to her. And I do want to uh, ask you, have you seen the movie White Oleander? I have not. I really highly recommend that movie for any um, anyone who has a mother, any daughter who's had a mother that was narcissistic because, oh my god, it's so on point. White my Oleander? White Oleander. It has Michelle Pfeiffer and... Uh, I forget who, uh, Renee Zellweger and a few other people. It's a good movie. It's sad, but it's good. All right, I have written that down. <laughs> I'm not sure where you can find it. I'll, I have it on DVD because I watched the hell out of it, but mm. yeah. Oh, I'm sure Greg <laughs> can find it. Ah, yeah. Wizard Greg. <laughs> yes. The Pantsless Wonder. Yes. <laughs> Hello, hope, goodbye, denial. Motherhood is still idealized in our culture, which makes it especially hard for daughters of narcissistic mothers to face their past. It's difficult for most people to conceive of a mother that's incapable of loving and nurturing her daughter, and certainly no daughter wants to believe that of her own mother. Mother's Day is this country's most widely observed holiday, celebrating an unassailable institution. A mother is commonly envisioned as giving herself fully to her children, and our culture still expects mothers to tend to their families unconditionally and lovingly, and to maintain an enduring emotional presence in their lives, available and reliable no matter what. Wouldn't that be nice? Right? <laughs> but that's, that's not the reality. As we stated before, there are some mothers that just aren't, that just don't have it. Mm -hmm. uh, even though this idealized expectation is impossible for most mothers to meet, it places mothers on a heroic pedestal that dis discourages criticism. It is therefore psychological wrenching for any child or adult child to imagine and discuss her mother frankly. It is especially difficult for daughters whose mothers don't conform at all to the saintly maternal archetype. Attributing any negative characteristic to mom can unsettle our internalized cultural standards. Good girls are taught to obey or ignore negative feelings to conform to society's and their family's expectations. They're certainly discouraged from admitting to negative feelings about their own mothers. No daughter wants to believe that her mother is a callous, dishonest, or selfish person. I mm. misread that, but there's the oh. test. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, I believe almost all mothers harbor good intentions towards their daughters. Unfortunately, some are incapable of translating those intentions into the kind of sensitive support that daughters need to help them through life. In an imperfect world, even a well-meaning mother can be flawed and an innocent child unintentionally harmed. Once we daughters begin to face the painful truth that maternal narcissism does indeed exist, we can start to address the disturbing emotional patterns that we have developed throughout our lives. You can courageously look at your past and heal from it by honestly facing up to these tough questions. Why do I feel unlovable? Why do I feel, why do I never feel good enough? Why do I feel so empty? Why do I always doubt myself? Mm -hmm. And they are tough. <laughs> yeah, I cried reading this portion. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of tearing up now, I'll be honest, but. 
Mm -hmm. I'm holding it back. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I just say, you can feel better and find a better way to live. You can understand what maternal narcissism did to you and decide to nurture yourself and feel good about who you are in spite of it. You can also prevent your own children from undergoing what you went through. Every woman deserves to feel worthy of love. Mm -hmm. It is my hope that as you come to understand how narcissistic mothers treat their daughters and as you gain support from the stories and advice you read, you will acquire the strength to break free from the longing for a mother you never had. Instead, you will be able to nurture and love the woman you have become. And that's so important to yeah. to give credit to yourself, to support yourself. And, you know, the, the feeling of empty or the feeling of missing, um, I don't think goes away. Um, I know when I first stopped talking to my mom, um... I would just break down and be like, I, I need to call her, um, I want to talk to her. And my sister Jenny had pointed out, she goes, listen for what you want from this. Like, what is the outcome that you want? Because you might be wanting a mother that's not her. Right. You know, you might just be needing your mom in that moment, but she is incapable of providing that support. I was really lucky to have a grandmother that did provide that support. And she she died when I was 14. Oh, I'm but sorry. and I didn't have as much time to spend with her as I wanted cuz we moved around a lot. My dad tried to prevent the relationship entirely cuz he was jealous. But I learned a lot from her in terms of what it's like to be a woman and how to be a nurturing and loving mother. Mm-hmm. And I'm really thankful to her for that. I miss my granny. That's good. I wish I had spent more time with mine. Um, my sister Jenny was really close with her, but um, she passed away when I was 13. And I was still kind of at the stage where, like, oh, grandma's not that cool or, you know. Yeah. So um, I, I really feel like I missed out in that respect. Yeah. My my grandma was so funny. I, I We were going to church one time, uh, one of the many times that my mom abandoned me at her house. Mm. And uh, I was getting ready and everything. I came out, my granny's sitting down and uh, on the couch or whatever. And she goes, you smell like a hoe. <laughs> I just laughed my ass off. It was amazing. She's a great woman. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Um, the questionnaire. Does your mother have narcissistic traits? Mothers with only a few traits can negatively affect their daughters in insidious ways. Check all those that apply to your relationship with your mother now or in the past. And a lot of these do apply, um, but there were specifically a few that brought up, um, basically like uh, really not important but really like classic examples of it right i don't know what word i'm looking for (laughs) it kind of defines your relationship mm -hmm. with uh, the way she her traits Mm -hmm. very well yeah yeah so my first is number eight does your mother do things for you only when others can see And there was one time that after a procedure that required sedation uh, for me, she had um, given me a ride, so she had me stay with her afterwards, because they typically say after you get sedation to have somebody around you in case something happens. Right. So we went there, only it was her asking me to take care of her for the entirety of the day. And um, I was having some pretty bad abdominal pain. And she kept making me, like, get up and do things. And I don't mind doing things every now and then, but this was just constant. And it was making the pain worse. And, like, I could not wait for 5 o'clock to roll around and Greg to be done with work to come pick me up. And he showed up around 5.30. And he's like, are you ready to go? And he's like, how are you doing? And I said, well, I have a lot of pain. And Mom goes, oh, Greg take her home. I can't stand to see her in this much pain. 
Oh my god. And I'm lucky she wasn't looking at him because his jaw damn near hit the floor. He's like, I know this is bullshit. <laughs> yeah. So we just like, I grabbed what I needed or what I had over there. And we got in the car and he goes, what the hell was that? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, she was making me do stuff all day long. She didn't care about me being in pain. <laughs> so. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. Oh, it's okay. That I is... lived. <laughs> Yeah, but, oh, Jesus. Uh, the next big one that I have, um, does your mother blame things, oh, sorry, it's number 12. Does your mother blame things on you or others rather than own responsibility for her own feelings and actions? And the phrase that this brought up in my mind was, look what you made me do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I... <sighs> I was kind of, like, she didn't outright blame me for things, mm. but she definitely made me feel like I was the only reason she was with my abusive father. Oh. And when oh, I that's was... that's a lot. Yeah, and when I was 16, she told me, you know, I, I had an abortion when I was 18 because she had been sexually assaulted, and that's, hey, fine, but... Mm. She said the only reason she had me was because she felt guilty about that abortion. Oh, holy shit. That's a lot to put on a kid. Yeah, it 16 really years old. I mean. Wow. <sighs> oh, I'm sorry you went through that. But, uh, you know, apparently all that was my fault. Right, you know, yeah. For, it was always our fault. <laughs> excuse me for existing, Mom. Like, <laughs> I, I didn't really have a choice in existing, right. so... <laughs> uh, and basically, me, basically, my response was, well, maybe you should have. Right. You no, know? and I still struggle, like, with that thought. Mm-hmm. Maybe you should have. Right. Because... I've had a really rough life <laughs> yeah. because of her and abusive father and just struggling. And my life has been this, this huge struggle. Mm -hmm. I'm just now getting to where I feel a sense of independence and happiness mm -hmm. and love. Yeah. And I'm 37 years old. Mm-hmm. Anyway. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Uh, next was number 14. Do you feel you were a slave to your mother? Oh, and, fuck yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> and she would always say, like, X chore is why I had kids. So she'll be like, oh, well, gardening? Oh, I have kids to do that. That's why I had you. So, yep. you know, go do that or go do laundry or go do the dishes, which chores are a very, like, crucial part of growing up and taking responsibility for you, but all of the responsibility was on us. Yeah, all of it. And my mom used to say, you know why I called you Jennifer, right? And oh, I was like, why? Because Jenny's a mule, and you're my mule. <gasps> That's why I had you. Holy yeah. shit! Yeah. Oh. Oh. Oh my god, that's horrible. Yeah. Fuck you, Mom. <laughs> right? Oh, shit. <laughs> and then, you know, I waited on her hand. She was disabled. I waited on her hand and foot, cleaned everything, did, you know, cooking, most of the cooking and stuff. But, you know, it never was... She acted like I never did anything for her. Mm -hmm. I was just... That was just my job. It was just who I was. It was her mule. The, it was in my very name. Jeez. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah. That's why I hate being called Jenny. <laughs> right? Yeah. I would be too. <sighs> Next I have um, number 29. Do you feel valued by your mother for what you do rather than for who you are? Mm. And a big one growing up was I will believe that you go to college when I see your diploma. And so that, that always like ingrained in me that okay, I will, I will finally be worth something if I can provide this diploma. And then when illness hit and I couldn't go to college, um, it, it really fucked with my self-worth 
that like, oh, well, mom was right all along. I won't be able to graduate then. Oh, honey. You know, even if you had, it wouldn't still, it wouldn't have been good enough either. No. <laughs> it wouldn't have. I'm sorry. That's... Oh. Yeah, we've both been through quite a bit. We have. (laughs) This is why we're twinsies, right? Right? (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, that is all for uh, chapter one. Um, Next time will be chapter two, The Empty Mirror, My Mother and Me. But um, why don't you tell people about your channel again? Show yourself. (laughs) Hi, I'm Mrs. Snarky, and I'm totally a shill. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, buy my art, by the way. I have art on Redbubble. Buy it. Uh, yes. Anyway. All, the, all the links are in the description. <laughs> of course, because you're so good at this. Wow. Um, <laughs> you are. Um, but yeah, I'm Mrs. Snarky. You can subscribe. Because, uh, I can't talk, but that's fine. Uh, if you like the kind of content where people can't speak properly, then subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> I do uh, philosophy, uh, politics, you know, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, check me out. It's well worth it. Definitely. Go over there and oh. subscribe. <laughs> oh, shucks. Thank you. But, yeah, um, we will be back and continuing more on this journey, our twins' journey. <laughs> Yay! All right. Well, have a good one, y'all. Bye. Bye. I will be here and I will sing stuff. <laughs> la 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 la. Welcome to the panic room where all your darkest fears are gonna come for you. Come for you. <laughs> this sounds so ominous for this recording. <laughs> <laughs> it fits. Yeah, it really does. <laughs>